you want to stay for a while? Come on down. I snuck something inside my bulletin this morning, and I'm going to give you guys some guesses what's inside, all right? So I've got something inside my bulletin. It's small, and it comes in a wrapper. Anyone want to take some guesses what it is? Small and a wrapper. What? A tattoo. A tattoo. Nope. Any other guesses? Small, comes in a wrapper. How about I give you another clue? I'll give you another clue. Um, they have adult ones. They're pretty plain and pretty simple. But they've got some kid ones, and they put like cartoon characters on them sometimes. What do you think about that? What do you think? Flat screen TV. A flat, uh, I have a flat screen TV in here? <laughs> I don't think I have a flat screen. What do you think? A, a what? A bandage. Nice guess. I do. I have a bandage in here. Um, and I was going to like, my next clue is going to be your mom's or your dad's like you get hurt and uh, they give you one of these. Who's ever been hurt doing something? Like what's something, like give me a quick story about some time that you got hurt. Go. I went down a really big hill and I got Oh, you went down a hill and your face got pretty cut up and stuff? All right. Whoever, you've been hurt? You ever done something and gotten hurt? Yeah, what'd you do? You remember? No? Did you ever need stitches or anything like that? No? Your cousin has? My mom, my mom cut her, her arm and she needed a stitch. She needed stitches? Yeah. Her, her blind fell down and, and her blind cut her arm. Ooh, that sounds... And she, and she needed stitches on her arm. That sounds painful. Does anyone like getting hurt? No, nobody, nobody likes getting hurt. Would anyone want to get hurt on purpose? No. No, right? We don't like going to the doctor. We don't like getting like casts and, and like stitches and stuff. That's not fun at all. I, I want to get you guys to think. And we of, don't like getting sick. Yeah, we don't like getting sick either. And I'm sick. You're sick now. Ah! All right, this is getting out of control now. All right, I'll, you guys, I want you guys to think about Jesus for a little bit. And Jesus goes to the cross. And when Jesus goes to the cross, that hurt a lot, right? I mean, he's, he's killed. But before he's killed, that had to hurt him a lot, right? He, that, was, that was painful. Why did, why did Jesus let people hurt him? What do you guys think? Why did Jesus let people hurt him? Because of the cross. Because of the cross? Sure. When, when Jesus goes to the cross, he lets people hurt him because that's a part of how he's going to pay for our sins because he loves us. Now, I want you guys to think about Jesus just a little bit more. When, when Jesus is at the cross... Think about some of the other stories that the Bible tells us about Jesus. He's able to do the miraculous. He's able to heal people. There's people that uh, weren't able to see. He's able to make them see. Uh, there's, there's that story where he walks on the water. Um, Jesus, he's incredibly powerful. When Jesus was on the cross, do you think he could have like asked an angel to help him get down from the cross? He, he could have, right? He could have gotten down, but he didn't. He chose to be there. Well, I want to I read for you guys one verse. This is from Luke 23, and this is what Jesus says to these other people that are there that have put him on the cross that have hurt them. He says to his father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I hope that you guys, when you guys think about Jesus, that you guys will remember that Jesus went to the cross, and he went there knowing that he chose to be there. He could, he could have left, but he chose to stay there because... Uh, he loves us. And I hope that you guys will always know how much God loves you and how God wants to forgive us all the time. So let's thank him for that. Dear Father, I thank you for each of the kids that you have here this morning. I thank you that you, you sent your son to the cross and he willingly stayed at the cross because of your great love for us. And I pray that you would help us to remember that over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go back to your families. Thank you. I thank you again this morning that we get to be in your house, that we get to, we get to worship you. We get to be together as family. And I pray this morning that as we look at your word, that you would uh, speak through it, uh, that your word would work powerfully in each of our lives, and we trust you for that. This morning, we, uh, we just lift up our friends that are here this morning, uh, whatever struggles, whatever pains, whatever joys, we, we know that you are there in the midst of all of them, and we pray that you would just give each of us a sense of peace and confidence uh, in your plans. I pray this morning for my friends that are uh, driving to Mexico, I pray that you just watch over them as they take these last few hours uh, as they get to the border and keep them safe uh, this week as they serve, as they work on the roof at the church uh, in Mexico. And I pray for our students and our bus that leaves uh, later this week. I pray that you would just watch over us and that our trip together would just be just a joy. 
Uh, I pray this morning for um, those that are grieving. I pray that you would just continue to just uh, speak into their lives with uh, your message of hope, uh, your message of grace. I pray that you would just comfort them and meet them exactly where they're at. I pray for my, uh, my friend Ron who has lost his wife. I pray that you would just comfort him now, uh, that you would be with him as, uh, as, as life is different. I pray that you would just bless him, and I just thank you for uh, the ministry that you've called him to be, uh, to be serving. And I pray for our friends, the Bronsons, that are missionaries overseas. I pray that you would be with them and their son Samuel right now on uh, ICU. I pray that you would just uh, encourage them and just show them how uh, you're working. I pray this morning that for uh, each one that is here, I pray that you would just remind us of your grace, that you would just work in us uh, the plans and the thoughts that you have for us. I pray that we would walk away with uh, just, a, just a sense of your calling that you put on each of us. And it's, uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I will uh, I'll let you in on a little secret this morning, and my secret is probably not really a secret. I love sports, but I'm terrible at sports. I love to watch sports, but I'm I'm not the guy that you pick to be on your team. Uh, Aaron's kind of nodding a little bit right there. I think he gets that. Um, but I love, I love playing sports. I love trying, even if it means that things don't go really well. I love to even just try. We had our basketball tournament last weekend. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We sent three teams up. Uh, and as I thought about our, our, our trip up there, I couldn't help but remember it was probably about 15 years ago I was a part of the same tournament. Uh, and my home church in New Jersey actually sent a team out. And it was some of my best friends that were on the team. And as they came out, I thought, you know what, I want to go. I want to hang out with these guys and just have a lot of fun. Uh, they had some really strong basketball players as well. We had one girl. She played uh, Division I basketball. She was, she was good. Uh, she was our point guard. And uh, every now and then, they would let me in the game, and they would let me play. And I scored, I think, like two points a game, probably had like two or three turnovers a game. So as a net loss, I probably did more damage than I did good for them. But we, we won, uh, we won our, our championship for our division that we were in. And the last game was close. The last game, it was free throws that kind of put the game away. At the end of the game, they had all the players who were standing on the sideline, were getting ready uh, to receive our trophy. And I'm looking at uh, Ellen, the girl that was our point guard, and I'm looking at one of the other guys who did a lot of the scoring, and I'm like, all right, you guys should go out to the center court and get the trophy. And then, like, my best friend Adam, he's standing next to me, and he comes up behind me, and he shoves me onto the court. And I go flying out into the court, and then the other guys are like, well, Mark's out there. We'll let him get the trophy. And I'm standing in the middle of the, the court, and I'm, I'm getting the trophy from the guy who's got the trophy, and I'm thinking about this trophy, and I'm thinking about, man, I brought nothing to the table. I don't personally deserve this trophy. My friends, they did, but I don't. And every time I think about getting that trophy and standing at half court, hearing friends and stuff cheering uh, and, and calling out me by name because I was there, I always think about, I got something that I didn't deserve. And, and how much is that thought, how much is that exactly what the message of Christianity is about? The message of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. We, we're given something that we don't deserve. This morning, that's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at that again. We're looking at how Jesus has done something actually by far greater. He has, he's, he's traded in his life and taken on death so that you and I can have life. And that is this just beautiful exchange that shows up. If, you're, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'll just invite you. We're in Mark chapter 15. Uh, we're going to start at verse 21. Uh, this is a great passage, and I'll just invite you to have your Bibles open and keep them open if you've got them with. Here's, here's what Mark's gospel tells us. It says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross, save yourself. In the same way, when the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves, they also said he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those crucified him with him also heaped insults on him. Those, those words, they describe with detail how Jesus takes on death in the face of deserving life. 
I, I don't know how to describe this perfectly, but the thought that I had as I heard these words was just a constant just picture of, uh, of piece by piece, moment by moment, bit by bit, Jesus uh, coming that much closer to death. And eventually, he does. He dies. And in these words, we see how he endures. We see how he suffers. We see how he's killed. And you can almost see how moment by moment he goes closer and closer to death. I'll take you to the first kind of scene that gives us a, a glimpse of this bit-by-bit torture that happens to Jesus. Simon, he's the guy that's named. He's carrying the cross for Jesus. And at first glance, you might read that and you might think, well, okay, that was nice. Simon carried the cross. But let's ask why. Why does Simon carry the cross? It's, it's probably that he carries the cross because Jesus is already in so much pain uh, from being flogged. Uh, a crucifixion. Uh, it often began with the flogging of a, of a victim's back. And the Romans, they used this whip, and the whip consisted of small bits of bone and metal. They were attached to a number of leather strands. So blow after blow, they, they just they beat Jesus with this instrument of pain. This was a painful, violent act. And words and pictures don't do this justice. This act alone would have left any of us in just incomparable pain. Well, after that, the next glimpse that we get of Jesus taking on death is he's offered this wine and this myrrh, and he's been marched up to this place called Golgotha. And by offering him wine and myrrh mixed together, basically what they've offered him is some sort of like narcotic so that he could escape like the pain that he would feel, the emotions of what he would feel. And for any criminal, this would have been a very generous offering. This would have been something that they would have said, yes, I want this, because they knew that this would have been something that would help them escape the pain that was to come. For Jesus, though, he has no intentions of escaping or minimizing anything of what was yet to come. Think about the crucifixion. Think about what that would have meant had Jesus physically been there but not mentally been there the same way that he was. If, if he had taken this, this would have, it would have lessened the impact of the cross, and Jesus had no, uh, no intent to lessen or to, to uh, minimize what was to come for him as he went to the cross. Now, if I was having surgery, uh, I would want to do everything possible to like eliminate any pain beforehand. I don't want to remember getting knocked out. I, I don't want to remember anything. I don't want to experience any pain. That wasn't Jesus, though. Jesus was willingly uh, wanting to endure the pain that was brought on him. And Jesus accepts all of that. The torture, though, it doesn't stop there. Uh, Mark's gospel goes on, and it says that Jesus, uh, he endured more suffering. And then we hear about this brutality that happens, that happens at the cross with the crucifixion. And all that Mark's gospel says about the crucifixion is simply that they crucified him. Now when you think about uh, the crucifixion and you think about these words, th these are short words to describe the torture and the pain that happens to Jesus. And, and maybe you kind of wonder, like, why, why did they not say uh, just more than they crucified him? Why is that all that Mark's gospel has to say here? See, Mark's gospel's intent is that we wouldn't get caught up in the emotion behind the details of what happened. The, the people uh, that lived in this time that would have heard these words first, they knew full well the details of what it meant uh, for someone to be crucified. They didn't need a big explanation. The, the point of Mark's gospel is to let us know that this did happen and to let us know that there is something significant that happens because of it that becomes available uh, to each of us. And when Rome did what it did to, to criminals... It had two intents. First, it, it crucified somebody, and it simply it gave them the judgment and the sentence that they deserved. And second, if somebody uh, watched this and they had any thoughts about doing anything criminal, this would be kind of a warning shot that would tell them, hey, you might want to think twice about doing this because this is something that could happen to you. Well, after this part of the, the scripture here, we see that more, uh, more is yet to come. And moment by moment, the torture continues. And Mark's gospel, it goes on and it tells us that they went and they divided up his clothes and they cast lots to see who got what they got. It was about, a, I think it was a month or two ago, I was, I was preaching and uh, I was sharing about this woman who went to Jesus for healing. And she went with just the intent just to grab, just to touch Jesus' garment with the hope that touching that garment might bring some healing to her own life. And, and she was, she was healed. It's, it's these same clothes that people would go to, to appeal to, uh, to find healing that are now being treated like raffle prizes in some sort of game. And, and as the garments of Jesus uh, are taken away, the humiliation of Jesus continues as well. And Jesus is left with barely any clothes, 
And those that are around, they just sit and stare and they gawk at him. And he becomes one who once was celebrated like a king, and now he's, he's a joke. He's, he's treated like he's a, a freak show or something. And if, and if any leader in our world today would have this happen to them, we know that they would completely feel humiliated. And that's what's happened here to Jesus. He is left, uh, he, he's just stripped bare so that he can be humiliated that much more. And then the torture continues. And in it, bit by bit, Jesus grows closer to death. And as the day continues, so does the crucifixion. And so does the torment, so does the ridicule. And, and as we see Jesus here, we have Jesus. He is He's God. He is creator of the universe. Everything that is in existence owes its existence to him. And how do we find him? He's been brutalized. He's been insulted. He's been treated the total opposite of how a king should be treated. And, and then those that are there, they do the things that mean kids have done for generations. They just insult him. They belittle him. They call him the king of the Jews. And as they do that, there is nothing, uh, nothing complimentary about that. And while he's there, there's two criminals that hang on the cross next to him, two guys who deserve being there. And as we see them at the cross, that shows us how much more of a circus that this has become. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, as he's injured, as he's tortured, those that are there, they insult him, they question him. They question his ability to do anything at all. They say things like, you're, you're going to destroy the temple, you're going to build it in three days, come down, save yourself. Others, they, they could just kind of say things like, well, he saved others. And even the criminals that were there with him, they insult him as well. And as Jesus is there, he becomes this, this human dartboard uh, for pastor buyers to just insult him. During his, during his earthly ministry, so many people, as they uh, heard about who he was, they failed to consider him truly to be the king. And now here at the end of his life, uh, before, he, before he dies, they're calling him the king, but it's, it's nothing complimentary. It's purely an insult. It's purely a joke. Then after all of that, uh, Jesus experiences the ultimate pain. And I'll just pick up the story in verses 34 to 36. Uh, but this is what the scriptures read. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. And then at three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of all the places in these last hours of Jesus' life, this is the darkest moment. This is the moment where Jesus experiences total separation from his Father. Why? Because God the Father can have nothing to do with sin. And now as Jesus is at the cross, he has taken on the sin of the world. And because of that, his Father can't see him. The Father can't be associated with him. And sin is something that God the Father just is completely distanced from because God is holy. And as Jesus takes on sin, the Father just can't stand the presence of the sin. So this becomes the darkest, most moment for Jesus. And, and, and how do we find Jesus here in this moment? We still find him looking towards his Father. As Jesus is at the cross, Jesus expresses, where are you, Father? In that question, we find that even at the cross, Jesus is still looking towards his Father. Maybe you can relate to this. You can relate to, you've had this like painful thing happen in your life, and you ask the question, why did this happen? Where are you, God? What's going on? I don't get it. And when we have those questions, we still look towards God for those answers. That's what we find here. Jesus is looking towards his Father. And as he continues to suffer, as he continues to experience this total separation, we find two responses from those that are there. First, you've got that continued verbal attack that's uh, directed at Jesus, that, that attack that asks uh, him to have Elijah come and rescue him. And second, there is actually a concerned response to his suffering. Uh, some uh, offer Jesus wine vinegar, and probably the only container that he could receive it in. And as he is given it this time, he accepts it. He takes it. This is a kind gesture. So why does he take it now when he didn't take that first drink that he was offered? Well, we said before that that first drink, he, was, uh, he, didn't, he, he wanted to experience the totality of what was happening. Here, though, this is at the end of his life, and he does. He takes it. And some, uh, as they've written on this passage, have said that the reason that he takes it now is perhaps so that he can have just a little more energy, so he can take that last, uh, last breath and say those last words. And one by one, that's what happens. His life is taken away. And then verse 37, we read that with a loud voice, Jesus breathed his last. And as this happens, so much of Jesus' ministry on, the, on this earth has become... Uh, now twisted. It's become perverted. It's just a matter of hours that Jesus has been humiliated. 
this, though, would become a powerful sacrifice. And with it coming with the fact that Jesus, three days later, rises from the grave, proves that this is, this is the greatest sacrifice of all time. This is the one sacrifice that can change eternity for you and me. We were, uh, we were watching TV a couple weeks ago, at, um, Chicago Fire, and um, there, was a, there was a scene where they had gone into the house. The house was on fire, and they were doing like a search and rescue. And as they went into this house, um, they saw a father. He was kind of heaped over on the, on the ground. And the firemen, they went to turn him over to see what, you know, was he okay? And the father was dead. But what the father had done was the father was laying on top of his children in the show, and he had saved the lives of his children. I thought about that scene. I was like, wow, that is powerful. That's what a good father does. A good father gives up his life for his children. Now, as we see Jesus here, Jesus has done something by far greater because Jesus has, he's done this sacrifice to rescue, uh, but he's done it for those that didn't deserve it. Last week, we talked about how Jesus uh, gives up his holiness uh, to take on sin and, and the price for Jesus to take on uh, sin and to make us holy is this death that we find happening here. And as Jesus goes to the cross, something beautiful happens. Jesus makes it possible for us to have life, for us to have hope. Remember back at the beginning of the story, there was Simon who carried the cross? Just think about Simon for just a little bit. Simon was this guy who carries Jesus' cross because Jesus couldn't carry it. As Jesus goes to the cross and as all that he experienced happens, he makes it possible for us to carry our crosses because he goes to the cross for us. There is this beautiful thing that happens. As you, as you consider these words, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for me? It means that we don't have to live life in fear. It means that we don't have to live life wondering what's next after this life. It means that we don't have to live life wondering, have I done enough good? It means we also don't have to live life wondering, have I done too much bad? Many of us, we will. We will wrestle with different fears. We will wrestle with questions about eternity. We will worry about life after this life. But the story of Jesus means that we don't have to. It means that we never have to worry, have I done enough to make things right? It means that we can be sure that our sins have paid for. For me, when I, when I don't look to the cross, I do. I worry. I, I think about things. I get stuck in fear. But the cross, it gives us a reason not to look to ourselves. Now, as you think about this, the characters that show up inside of this story, I want to just get you to one character specifically. And yes, Jesus is the main character. And there are a number of characters that show up in this passage. There's the witnesses that are there that are kind of hoping that pain will happen. There's those that are there that are grieving. There's uh, Simon who carried the cross. There's those who offered uh, the wine to Jesus. There's the soldiers who, who beat Jesus. There's those who mocked him. There's the women at the end of the story who are grieving as they see, uh, as they see Jesus there. There's also a very quick mentioning of a soldier who comes to terms with who Jesus is as he sees the, uh, the end of Jesus' suffering. And verse 39 gives us a very short but very profound moment. It says that this soldier came to say this. He said that this man was the son of God. I love this soldier's admission here. This soldier makes this admission that Jesus is the son of God. This soldier, he, he perhaps never saw the miracles. He was just a witness here at the end. And his loyalties up until this part in the story, uh, they were always to Pilate, they were always to the government, and his understanding of the world up until this point in time was tied to government, it was tied to structure. No longer, though, is he willing to hang on to that. Now he sees Jesus for who Jesus is. And in an instant, he comes to understand that Jesus is God. And in an instant, his life gets turned upside down. I get to ask us this morning who we see Jesus to be. Is Jesus some random moment in history? Is he some character that we've kind of just vaguely heard of? Or... Is Jesus the Son of God? I, I love this soldier's realization of who Jesus is because sometimes, sometimes we make it sound so hard to be a Christian. Pray this prayer, do this, look like this. And sometimes when that happens, people wonder, did I do it right? Did I, did... That's not the case here, though. Simply this man, he realized who Jesus is. How did that change his life thereafter? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us like, too much about this guy other than this. Did he start going to church every week? Did he start, was he a missionary? I, I don't know that part. What I do know is that right now in this part of the story, this man comes to this point where he admits that Jesus is God. And simply, 
That's our hope for everyone that's here, that we would come to this realization as well, that Jesus is God. And that is our prayer for you today. Let's pray. Dear Father, I, I thank you that you sent your Son into this world to meet each of us where we're at. I wish that it hadn't been uh, so violent, so, so painful, that Jesus wouldn't have had to die, but he did, and I thank you for that. I thank you that because of your Son, uh, you have made possible for us to have life. And I pray this morning for each one that's here that you would give us a sense of hope, that you would give us a sense of confidence that you have done it all. And I pray that we would, uh, we would respond like this soldier did, recognizing that Jesus is God. I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jerusalem that day, the soldiers tried to clear that narrow street. But the crowds pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way of suffering, came the Lamb like the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary. For La Via Dolorosa, Triste and Jerusalem. 